you talk about the pain, and I think this is something that people don't get, myself included. Um, uh, the pain was so bad. Part of the pain was the thought of what I'd become. I could hardly picture the new me, yet the pain was more than emotional. It was a physical pain. It coursed through my body. I felt like I was on fire. I tried to focus on my breathing and take stock of why my pain was so bad. Even with all the medications flowing through me, it still felt like I was in a red hot vice. I could hardly take it. I knew Josh would never lie to me, but my arms and legs still felt like they were attached. My hands felt like they were burning, like someone was clamping them inside of an industrial furnace, but my hands weren't there. The flames were eating away my ligaments, my nerves, my skin, my legs, my phantom legs were clamped in that same fire. Bolts of agony surged from limbs that weren't, the regist- that weren't there and registered to a brain that still was. The pain came and went, came and went, came and went. Josh started in his seat and leaned, or started in his seat and leaned closer. Travis, you need me to get the nurse? Nurse? I didn't say anything. I was itchy and sweating bad. He pressed a buzzer, then, then went out and got a cool cloth and laid it on my forehead. The nurse came in and upped my morphine. Just before I went under again, everything that I'd always drilled into myself rushed through my mind. Never show fear. Never let your guys see you in pain. Don't cry out. Even when I'd been lying on the ground, right after the blast, I'd felt pain then, but I hadn't showed it. When that IV was shoved through my chest, that was chest that was painful, but I wasn't going to complain then. You don't let people down. You just don't. But this time, the pain was so bad. It was still so bad, even with more painkillers in me now. So bad. So bad. So bad. This time, I wanted to do the unthinkable. Two words rose and began to vocalize within my throat. Josh, I said, yeah, what do you need, buddy? I swallowed and whispered two words. I quit. Yeah, not good. I, uh... I don't know what, I mean, this is a lot of pain, I guess. I don't know why. I'd, you know, you, you sit there and you question, like, am I going to be a burden on my family? Right. Why, how, you know, my wife, should she stay with me? I mean, what do I have left to offer? Um, my daughter, am I going to be a monster when I get to see her finally? And then it's like, why did I live through this? Why, you know, why did I make it? Not that I'm, I guess, angry I lived or at the time, of, you know, when that was happening. I wasn't so much angry it's just more of a question like why well, what's what's the purpose why not just let me go out my wife gets you know 400,000 from the government and then she can go remarry and have somebody that's able-bodied and and live a happy life but that you know a lot of questions are you know when you're sitting in the hotel room or I mean a hospital bed you know in the hospital room and you just gotta stare at the ceiling the whole time you just never know what what to think in the military it's easy everything is laid out for you this is yeah. our mission today this is our plans what we're going to do this is how we're going to get it done there it's just all unknown and that pain, like from missing limbs, it sounds freaking horrible. Oh yeah, I mean it was like a spike getting drove through my heel, uh, fingernails getting like just ripped off and then seared, and it was just it was bad. What causes that? Uh, well, I mean a lot of it is phantom limb pain. So your nerves try to find where your hands and your feet are, and if they can't find it, they try to redirect and keep trying to find it. So it's just one excruciating, you know, zap to another, and then. They uh, and you you probably can talk. They had like experimental um, things they tried on me because yeah. it was so bad. And after the second one, they tried. Um, I was like, oh, I feel a little better. And then the the doctor like was all excited. And I was like, oh, now the pain's back. And I went, you know, got all yelling out in pain and stuff. And he just he actually cried. He felt so bad because it was to the point where they got to find some cure, mm. or I'm gonna be so um um. Just an agony. Yeah, agony, or I'll, I'll be so used to the medication um, uh, that if the doses are going to get to the point where I'm just going to OD on them, you know, because I'm going to be yeah, so so uh, accustomed. I can't think of the word right now. It's killing me. Uh, yeah. Like your tolerance. Is to- yeah, my, yeah, Good, yeah, yeah. My tolerance would be so high that I'm just going to end up ODing. Damn. Of course, you, I was kind of you know you wonder where you get your sense of humor. You're telling your dad what happened, and you're like, I stepped on a mine, went flying through the air, I did a 180, it was crazy. Well, Travis, my dad said, 
the important question is, did you look good doing it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I think I did. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, and meanwhile, Kelsey, she, she, you know, you've been voicing some of these concerns mm-hmm. like about, hey, can I even be a good dad now? Can I, am I going to be a burden? You're kind of telling Josh some of those things. And she told, or he told Kelsey, and here we go back to the book. My brother told me that Travis is nervous to see me because he doesn't know how I will react or if I will continue to love him as my husband. These worries seem so trivial to me because I will love him through sickness and health until death do us part. I did not use those words lightly when we got married. I will be by his side every day for the rest of our lives, whether he likes it or not. I know his natural reaction will be to push me away because of embarrassment or feelings of letting me down, but I just wish I could constantly reassure him that my love for him is unwavering. Yeah, I mean, when I saw her, I told her she should go. I said, you know, hey, you should take what we have. The house is yours. The cars are yours. Sell mine. You know, whatever and do what you need to do and I'll financially fund whatever I can you know and she was like that's not how this works <laughs> you I know want you, that handicapped parking you know <laughs> what she said so it's like oh uh, <laughs> man you uh, uh there's like a level of luck involved when you get married I don't care who you are um oh you yeah. know like you could easily marry like Satan <laughs> you know, and I know, I know you, I know plenty of guys that have made some really bad, I can't even call them bad decisions. Cause just like, oh, okay. I understand if you have this great courting thing and all that and you're whatever that you can make a good decision and that's great. But like a, a lot of guys in the military, you're young and you're like, you know what? We're getting married. And there's just like a flip of the coin and yeah. you, you got a saint. I mean, I literally did flip. I'm like 17 days in person. You know what would be great? If we just went to Mexico and then decided we're going to get married and then we just got married. Yeah. Let's do that. Let's be a great story for everybody, whether it works or not. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> man. You scored for sure. Uh, and she got lucky to have me too. Well, I didn't really pick that up. But um, okay, we'll mm. go with it. Yeah, we'll keep <laughs> moving on. Hey, how was it when you saw Chloe for the first time? So you need to get back to Walter Reed. I did. Uh, and- April 17th. I uh, got back and um, the first time I got to see Kelsey wasn't that Hallmark moment. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, I love you so much. It was actually, I was getting rushed in. My right, uh, one of my right leg ripped open. And I'm like, Mrs. Mills, you're in charge of medical history now. You have to sign this piece of paper. Um, he has to get two inches to cough his right leg. We need your consent. You know, consent. And she's like, what? And she almost passes out. And they're like, Mrs. Mills. I'm like, Kelsey, just sign the paper. And I'm yelling, just sign the paper. It's okay. And she signs it. And that's the first time I got to see her just real quick. Yep, go ahead and hack them up. And they went and took my leg two inches off on the right and resealed it. And the next day is when I tell her, like, you know, this isn't probably anything that you signed up for. You you can go, and, you know, you're no, it's no big deal. I, I'm not worried about it. And she's like, nope, not how this works. We'll get through this together. Damn. And then awesome. they, you know, they induced me into this coma later on because the pain was so bad. And I was getting my tolerance level built up for the pain meds. And uh, she sat on my bed like 20 hours a day. And I, knowing I wasn't going to wake up for five days, like we're going to put him out for five days. So, yeah. So this was crazy. Uh, reading about in the book, you you're in such horrible, horrible pain, like undescribable pain. Is this basically an experimental thing procedure that they did on you? Yeah. I'm the uh, second in the nation to ever have the ketamine coma and 30th in the world. And so, so a lot of case studies on me. The ketamine coma is 600 mili- milligrams of ketamine per hour. Yeah. So it goes around in- the clock. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to, well, it, it's based on like weight and things, so I'm sure like everybody's okay. different measurements. But uh, they, when they did it, you go in and then it just circulates through. It's supposed to reset your brain to think where your nerves end, or where they end, and you know you come out and it's just you hallucinate like crazy. Yeah, and anything on TV is what was real life to me. Yeah, no, the, I'll I'll hit some highlights from your hallucinate because when you get when yeah. you get done out of the coma, you're in a coma for five days, mm-hmm. which is just black nothing. Right. There's no nothing, nothing there. Then you go into hallucinations. You got um, chasing kids that stole things from Walmart. You got Genghis Khan that you're out with Genghis Khan. Your a SWAT team is coming to get you. You got you and your cousins are riding skateboards in a TV reality show. You got yourself playing hockey in the NHL. Um, I was particularly concerned about a 50 year old go-go dancer that crawled on a leash down the hallway of Walter Reed That one made me a little bit nervous Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a service dog apparently (laughs) Kramer from Seinfeld stops by so so you go through these massive hallucinations that that's freaking weird. Yeah, I mean it got to the point where 
I'd get on my tangents and they said for the first like seven days, you know, it's going to be bad. Then after that, it'll start to fade out. And at 10 days, you should be able to tell when you're having one or not. But I remember my father-in-law come in one morning and the Caps game was on the night before when I was watching it. I was like, I scored nine goals with Ovechkin. And I had a triple hat trick. He's like, oh, that's, that's great. Damn. And then I thought that way I got blown up. And I woke up the very first day. I thought that this guy from my hometown made a derogatory comment towards my mom, my wife, my daughter, and my buddies. And I jumped in the car and chased him and went off the road. And I smacked a tree and I killed my two best friends. And like I made my mom and my wife. And you like, full on oh, believed those 100%. I told my brother-in-law the story just as intently or intense as I told my wife. And he listened. He's like, oh, yeah. And everybody was just going with it instead of trying to like argue with me. And they're like, we're just going to go with this. And I called and left my, my buddies a message. And I'm like, I'm so, I, I, I hope you're not dead. <laughs> and then I finally came out of the hallucination and I realized what happened. And my brother and I walked back in. I was like, hey, man, thanks, you dick. He goes, well, I didn't want to tell you any different. And I was like, yeah, no, I understand. You know, that's like don't text when you're drunk or whatever. Yeah. Don't don't yeah. don't call people and leave messages when you're on seven day hallucinatory yeah. trips. And I only left two messages, but they were to my best friend, so it was cool. <laughs> and both of them was I'm sorry I killed you. Like, hey man, I hope you're not dead. I think I killed you. <laughs> and uh and then I got to the point where I could tell what was going on. Yeah. So I like I started to have another one. Um and then I was like, Oh, that's hallucination. And then finally I got to the point where I was playing with people. Like Josh was in my room and I was like, Josh, he goes, What? I goes, I see dead people. <laughs> I said, what? You're serious? I'm like, no, I'm just kidding. He's like, okay. And then I started looking at the ceiling. I was like, oh, they're all around me. He's like, wh- wh- where? Where? I'm like, oh my gosh, Josh, you're everywhere. And I like jabbed him. And I was like, oh, you son of a. So I started messing with people once I got the hang of it. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, and that kind of like did it though, right? Like, Yeah. Yeah. So I did about five more months of pain pills. Um, and then finally, like in October, I was home for Thanksgiving in North Carolina at my house at Fort Bragg. And I was just like, you know what? Kelsey came in. I was like, I don't want them anymore. I'm done. She's like, you can't just quit these. And I said, no, really, I'm done. So it was like five days of pain, and then now no medication, nothing. I'm good to go. Damn. So the ketamine coma, and my documentary, you know, it says I wouldn't do it again. But that was five months after the fact. So I was still like doing pain pills and stuff, mm-hmm. or four months after the fact, I guess, because it was in September. Um, but looking back, like that was the best, the best thing yeah. for me to get me past the, you know, the pain part, and then onto my recovery and you were the second person that ever had that done i guess in the nation that's crazy i guess yeah um i thought this is a great talking about your kind of transition mentally going back to the book back in normal days i loved the challenge the quest to succeed in the army had always been a challenge for me my situation now as a quadruple amputee held out the same sort of dare to succeed sure if i could have changed things i wouldn't have been in the situation but i couldn't change things being a quadruple amputee was my new reality I could quit for good. I could shut myself off from the world. I could will myself to die. Or I could fight forward and keep on living. Freaking legit. Well, I mean, it came down to a choice at the end of the day. Um, I was still here. My wife's going to stay on my side. My daughter, who I think is going to think I'm a monster, still laughs and snuggles up with me. And, you know, I mean, when she first saw me, I thought she was going to be really afraid. But then short arms, short legs, fuzzy chest. I look like a teddy bear. She's like, oh, another toy, you know. But this one can talk. Yeah, it's cool <laughs> and interactive. Uh, I've never been stern with my mom. I did break my mom's nose one time. A whole different story. <laughs> Karate? Uh, no, my dad and me were slap boxing in the kitchen, which meant I was seventeen. My dad was trying to mess with me, but yeah. if I slap back, he'd be like, "You do? You can take me?" And I'm like, "No, bro. I thought we were just playing." <laughs> but he slapped at me. My mom was behind me, and I caught her back of my head. Mm. Scariest day of my life. Um, you don't make her mad. <laughs> and but anyway, so I was only stern one time. My mom. I woke up. You know, and I was supposed to get all the rest I could. And I said, where's Chloe at? She's like, oh, they already came to visit, but you were sleeping. And I was like, don't ever let me sleep through that again. That's the whole reason that I'm able to still keep functioning is because of my daughter and, you know, uh, being there and my wife. But, uh, you know, the mental part was the worst. Mm-hmm. At 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock at night, I couldn't have the lights on in my in my apartment. Something to do, I thought it was like the operating table. I start sweating real bad. I just, I mean, now I'm fine. But mm-hmm. for the first, like, I don't know, probably five, six months, I was just like, no lights at this time. It's quiet hour. <laughs> And things and, like that. And man, I started watching, like I watched a you know video of you as you were training, as you were now relearning everything. Look, and I, I never really understood when people say, "Oh, like, you, you got to re, you know got to relearn to walk," and you got to relearn. And I didn't really make sense of it, but it's really clear to see when you watch your progression what that looked like, like how you were clearly relearning how to walk. Like I never understood that, but when you watch the videos and the the progression that you made, you can see that that's what it's, it looks like. When you first stood up, I'm like, oh yeah, it looks like he's learning how to walk. And sure yeah. enough, you got better and better and it's 
pretty amazing. And and uh, two things you're going to find out when I when I was going through my uh, recovery. The first thing, I learned how to walk with my daughter, which was kind of cool. They got me little short legs, and I was stumbling around, and she was stumbling around. We are holding hands. And the next thing, you found out my love for Philly cheesesteaks <laughs> because I do less workouts and stuff like that at the gym, you know, as you go. But I went from 250 to 140, <laughs> and I was real skinny. And then all of a sudden, I start getting fatter and fatter and fatter because of Lyrica and the medication. And I was just like, oh, I love Philly cheesesteaks. So I'm trying to work on that now. <laughs> but my progression is I got better. I got fatter, too. It's embarrassing. <laughs> and you got but, a visit from a guy named Todd Nicely. Mm-hmm. And that must have helped out a lot. Uh, my competitive edge did. He walked uh, in on his fake legs and two fake arms. And he first thing out of his mouth was, hey, man, welcome to the club. <laughs> I was like, I don't be in your club. <laughs> <laughs> he said, kind of late now, don't you think? And I looked at myself and I was like, oh, you got me there. <laughs> and uh, as he walked over, I said, you want a ginger ale? And he heard me wrong, and he went over to the counter, uh, or the sink, and underneath the sink was, was a 12-pack of ginger ale. I got hooked on it like crack at the hospital. I got off it now, but either way. <laughs> he bends down on one knee, bends down on his other knee, reaches on with his fake hand, gets it out, pops the top of his other arm, and walks over and hands it. He goes, here you go. I'm like, oh, no, I was asking if you wanted one, but before I got the full sentence out, I said, how'd you do that? He's like, hey, man, I'm Todd, and I'm the second ever. Welcome to the club. You're the fourth. Uh, quadruple amputee to make it back home. You're going to be fine. I live in Missouri with my wife. I drive. I have a boat. I do whatever I want. I walk. It just takes time. And uh, he's like, I'll even work out with you tomorrow. You know, this is like, I'm still thinking I'm in hallucination mode. This is <laughs> this is like maybe eight, nine days after my, my uh, ketamine coma. And he's like, I'll work out with you tomorrow. So the doctors come in and I'm like, hey, I got to work out today. And they're like, you can't work out. You know? And I was like, no, no, seriously, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work out with Todd nicely. He said I can work out at one o'clock. And they're like, well, you're not ready. And I had to let him know. I was like, I don't know what you don't get, buddy. We're go- I'm working out today. And I, he said, I'll think about it. So I called him every half hour, four hours straight to find said I could. And I went and met Todd. And, and Todd did a workout. And I laid on my stomach with a pelvis uh, pad under my, under, under my stomach or whatever. Mm-hmm. So that stretched my pelvis muscle back out. And he pat my back. And I fell asleep 20 minutes. Best workout I've ever done. But um, I started my recovery that day. And in, as far as the physical, it was easy. Uh, I was, you know, I liked the, the physical challenge. Uh, the mental was the hardest part for me. I mean, bar none, it was, it was the worst, you know, I couldn't look at myself in the mirror for a while there. Cause I didn't like what I saw, mm-hmm. you know, seeing my, my arms gone, the scars, um, just the overall mess that, that I was and, um, thinking that I was going to be a burden and all that. So it just, that's just how it went. So the more capable you got, the more comfortable you got in your new skin. Yeah. Well, I found out that they let you go for one hour. And then uh, physical therapy and then one hour of occupational therapy. And then they let me do another one and another one t- turned into four hours of, of each. So eight hours. I was putting eight hours a day at the gym in my recovery. Well, at the gym and occupational therapy. Learn how to use my hands, how to wash myself again, how to dress myself again. Uh, learn how to drive. Learned how to do all that stuff. But it, it took 19 months of at Walter Reed. 13 months in paperwork was after that to get out. But <laughs> government. <laughs> uh and you, you, um, you eventually went and met your guys when they came home, though. That's I did. freaking awesome. I did. I set some goals. Um, when I was in the hospital on my birthday, I called my wife and my mom and dad, and I was basically really short. Hey, guys, what's up? I'm fine. Love you. Bye. That's all I wanted to say. I didn't want to talk and have a conversation and go over what happened to me. Um, I kept it very short. But I told my brother-in-law, I said, I have to call my guys in my unit. You need to find the number to my strong point and let me talk to them. So there's a picture going around where I had a uh, a baseball cap, or no, I was out on patrol, and I had sleeves rolled up and uh, helmet off, sunglasses. I mean, everything out of standard as they as you know they have standards or whatever. And I got a hold of my sergeant major. And I said, Sergeant major, I'm so sorry. I understand if you got to take my rank. Uh, I should have been out of uniform. I do apologize. And now the picture's going public. And he's like, You're crazy, dude. Like, just get better. You're fine. And then I got a hold of my my guys, and I told them, Guys, I'm fine. I'll be okay, and I'll be there when you get back from Afghanistan. I'll be there at the, you know, the ramp to give you guys a hug on my tall legs. And it took me a while. I got my tall legs that morning when they got back. I had to work out three hours. Dang. And then the tall legs don't bend, but like not the ones I'm wearing now, but they're, they make me at least six foot tall. Well, you can't take those legs home unless you can stand up when you fall down. So the whole day the therapist walks up and says, trust fall. And they knock you down. And you're like, you, what the hell? Like, that's not a trust fall. You're supposed to catch me. <laughs> I'm supposed to close my eyes and trust you're going to catch me. And they're like, that's the catch. You got to get yourself back up. <laughs> Therapists are great. No, I had I had two of the best therapists uh, that that you could ask for. No, I'm Carrie and Joe, and they got me you know back to where I was at. But I did meet my guys, and the first one of the first people I got to hug was Doc Bateson. 
you know, and say, hey, man, thanks for all you did. And then you end up doing a 5K? Mm-hmm. 5K run? So, well, I mean, I that was, run, that was like yeah. another goal? Yeah, so Todd Nicely came in. And when he met me, he had four firefighters also for Tunnel the Towers 5K they do in New York City. And they also, they partner with Gary Sneese and they build houses and things like that for guys that have been through traumatic injuries. And they were like, hey, we're going to have a 5K in September. We're gonna, you know, we'll, we'll push you. I'm like, I'll walk it. And they're like, well, yeah, but like, we'll push you. It's no big deal. And I was like, no, you don't understand. Like, I'm just going to walk it. And they're like, well, you don't have legs yet. But if you do walk it, that's cool. So I went out to New York City after my daughter's birthday uh, the day after and walked the 5K. Uh, I came out of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel thinking, okay, I'm going to sit down now. Like, I'm tired. My back hurts. I got a mile, you know, 1.2 miles or something to go. My right leg, I had completely rubbed raw. And I was <laughs> bleeding inside my socket. And I was like, it, it's good. I, I've, I've met a goal i've walked over to you know two miles now and uh i came out of the tunnel and there's 343 firefighters with banners around their neck for 9 11 i thought geez okay well if those guys and gals can go up down those flights of stairs and then ultimately die um you know trying to save lives i can finish this so i did i was sore it was bad but i didn't did finish it and then um Eventually, you're like you said, you're driving now. Mm-hmm. You, you went out and did like mountain biking and skiing and all this other kind of just getting after it, basically, for, for better, for lack of a better term. Um, and then you and then you retire. You retire from the from the army. 